Batman or Superman. You know, it's not something uh, for mass consumption. And it has a very hard edge to it. Well, The Crow brings you into a world unlike you've ever experienced before, and that's what a movie should do, especially in the area of uh, fantasy film. I think you try and keep the integrity of the comic, what the comic was trying to say, and the vision of the comic, and you push it a bit further. Um, you know, what may, what, you know, for a, um, a physical standpoint, what may have worked in the comic frame may not work as a piece of action in the film. I hope the, the expressionist um, graphic thing really holds, you know, comes through. I think that as a genre, comic books. that audience is interested in. I think that the film is quite faithful to the comic book. I hope that it is, in terms of preserving that hard edge and a certain style that the comic book certainly has. But we had the responsibility to fill in some gaps that aren't necessarily there in the comic book because they're different mediums you know you don't have to tell a cohesive narrative story in a comic book you can do a lot with images and leave a lot up to uh, the imagination of the reader and he gradually learns along with the audience why why he's come back what his mission is and the comic book um, right right from page one he knows exactly what he's there for When I drew the book, I drew it in storyboards, and I always intended it to be in black and white um, with the flashback sequences in, in Technicolor, and Alex is pretty much doing exactly that. He's using filters and um, you know special optical effects to pretty much wash out all the color uh, to keep, this, um, keep it a really bleak film. And then the, the flashbacks are going to be in this bright technicolor, vibrant reds and yellows. Right from the first meeting I had with Alex, we discussed removing um, greens and blues and really controlling the palette completely. So the rain and the steam help that a lot because they just bleach out whatever color's there. Um, but, but that's definitely been a very important part. We've, we've censored across the board any any cold colors, any, any blues, greens, or anything like that. I really tried to create a monochromatic palette with, with red. And so in terms of color, the red is kind of the revenge color whenever we get into the bad guys. We're trying to introduce elements of red. I would have deeply loved to shoot the whole film in black and white. But personally, I love black and white. I think it's wonderful. Um, it would have been great to do that and show perhaps just uh, the flashbacks, which are a part of Eric's real life his life when he was alive, show those in color as contrast, you know. But uh, unfortunately, due to the realities, the, the very shitty realities of, of the film world, we, we weren't given the opportunity to do that. Eric the Crow is an everyman and uh, was intended to be so. Uh, someone who is not remarkable in their life, but is remarkable once given the, the chance to return from the dead and to make amends to avenge uh, the murder of himself and his fiance, Shelley. You're dealing with uh, a supernatural situation, which is a man who has come back from the dead. And I think the thing that I enjoy most about this film is simply the the questions that that raises for me as an actor playing the part and for the audience who's going to see the film if you died and a year had passed since the time that you had died and during that year you have to assume that the people that you loved and, and the people who were in your life and loved you would have had a year now 
to grieve and come to some kind of terms with having lost you. And now suddenly you are given the chance to come back for two days. The world would be a very different place through your eyes from the point of view of having been dead for a year and knowing that you only had two days now to be alive in a sense again. And there would be some fascinating questions that would confront you like, wouldn't you want to tell somebody? But at the same time, wouldn't you feel a certain responsibility not to trammel in the lives of the people who have had a year now, like I said, to deal with that loss? And you would see the world through these very different eyes, these eyes that are coming from a, a point of view and a perspective that no one really has. I think what he's doing is tremendously romantic, but um, I wouldn't I wouldn't term him a hero. I must say I'm really inspired by the depth of feeling of the original inspiration of this. You know, when someone confronts those kinds of issues, you know, mortality and why is evil in the world and if I can play a part in sort of illuminating that for an audience, as we know, reading is going away in the world, you know, and uh, if we can re-inspire people to, you know, just as Milton was inspired by Homer and Virgil, you know, uh, Obar is inspired to make his true experiences an homage to Milton and Poe, you know, we can stay in a great line, you know, uh, I don't want to say you know, that we're in that league, but we're inspired by that, so at least we can, you know, remind people of those other things too, you know. Um, this is the first time I saw a movie that is now. You know, we're always sort of reaching back and pulling the things that we used to do. This is a movie that, that's happening. I mean, it's, it's uh, you see the whole uh, impact that MTV had with just the images being flashed up. But here's a movie that has these very, very powerful images and yet there's a story there. The story doesn't get interrupted. The, the love story is intact, and yet around it, things are happening. And that's how I feel life is now. Sometimes we want to sort of keep, I try to keep it simple so that I understand everything, but the reality is it's, it's happening all around, and uh, it's hard to keep up with. So this movie, in my opinion, reflects a lot of that. And it's the first time I've really seen that come together. I keep going back to these two major models. You, know, you can find that in Poe, this kind of creepy humor that's there, that's just on the edge of true fear. When the raven is tap, tap, tapping on the window. Hey, hey. <laughs> Suddenly, I heard a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. There's a kind of wicked humor in those kinds of things, you know. That's the same kind of thing that we're going for here, you know. It's not a, it's not something that uh, tries to be sort of outside the reality or the, the truth of the inspiration that we're doing, but I think it shows up, you know, as it shows up in life. I mean, the very bizarre situations are often darkly funny. stuff wasn't as difficult I mean a lot of the running and shooting and all that stuff um, that's um, that was probably the, the easier part I'm not much into well I mean action stuff is fun so it's kind of fun to do it kind of reminds me of being a kid and playing cowboys but um, trying to find where this person is I mean in terms of his evolvement um, as a human being uh, that's what and, and, and to be able to show that um, and to find that part of me that is in, indeed similar, that was probably the, the, the real challenge. And hopefully, I, I know that if I can do that, then, uh, then, then I've done my job and it, it works. Grange is a strange guy. I didn't really have a fix on him until I discovered this piece, which is uh, 
to me has a lot of, it, I mean, this, it looks simple enough, but it's like just the one little thing I needed that added a little comic book element. Um, <clears throat> Grange is a corporate killer. He's an assassin who enjoys what he's doing. He's an ex-Vietnam person, um, but he really enjoys. He's the type of guy that if, if his task was to separate the flies from the honey, he would enjoy taking the flies out and then doing something else with the honey. I mean, he's just, he, 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 he likes investigating the nature of, of death. I've played a lot of characters, but I've never played the character as Micah. So people think she's me, this character's very mean and evil. That's the character I never played. So I'm very excited about that. For me, movies are larger than life. So any chance you get to make a, a larger than life character that's grounded in the reality base, because you can't act unless you understand a small, minute thing about it. Uh, that's exciting. Maybe there's a part of, um, of that Eric is a part of Albrecht. I don't know if so much father, son, but just there's a piece of him um, that, he, that he connects to and that he knows. I think he knows um, the character. He, he knows, I mean, it's that place that you, you feel, he knows this person. It's, it's, I think from the time the incident happened, it's always been there, this, this meeting, this, this um, sharing is, is destined to happen. He can't quite, I mean, he stayed with the girl until she died for 30 hours. That's saying a lot. Faust glorifies violence in comics. Um, I use violence as a means to an end. Eric gets the chance to come back and try and see that some kind of justice is done. It's not necessarily a pretty subject, but it's one that I feel comes from him very organically and is quite justified. I guess it's not a good day to be a bad guy, huh, Skank? What a Skank? That Skank right there. <laughs> skank dead. That's right. <laughs> I try to always try and uh, have some type of signature on it as far as making everything a little bit different. Um, so that way it's, at least, I mean, maybe you might have seen certain fights on rooftops or something, but at least there'll be certain beats in there, certain uh, moments where it'll hopefully be something where you say, oh, that's a little bit different, this is a little bit different, or their characters will be more, the fight will be more character-oriented, where it's more deeply involved with the characters as opposed to just two people fighting and, and, and that's it, you know. So at least you'll feel that the way they're fighting is part of their, is the way that person would actually fight as a character. We never miss. Try hard. Try again. Basically, you've got a bunch of criminals in, in one room that are from different areas of town, different nationalities, uh, all brought together by one man, and uh, yet very suspicious of each other, but still a certain uh, bonding between them. And then you got Eric coming in, who's uh, after uh, Skank and everything else, and is there to just clean house. I mean, let's face it, this, is, this film represents, as most good films would, an escape from reality. And the world right now is, is not as a sun-kissed, lemony place that we would like to maybe pretend it is. So I think the good thing about films like this is that they can provide some sort of healthy catharsis to be able to, for two hours, forget about that world outside. I'm, I'm, I'm aiming at that audience that watches it on 42nd Street, which is where I got a lot of my basic film education. They go in there, they buy the popcorn, and they're talking and they're intercoursing with each other, and they're, for a moment, all focused on a singular purpose. And I think that this film will certainly hold their attention as well as any that's been done, and probably beyond. I'll tell you something, I don't really care about any statements the film makes that have to do with that, because that's, that's not Eric's point of view. Uh, I'm sure that the, the, the world of this film is going to be a better place once, once the bad guys aren't there anymore. But that's not Eric's reason for doing what he's doing, and so it's not something I've stopped to consider a great deal. There's this wonderful uh, quote 
from the book Sheltering Sky, where he says, because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. And yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood, an afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it, perhaps four or five times more, perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20, and yet it all seems limitless.